very pleased to have back in the studio with us Danielle Blevins, who is the Supreme Court reporter with Talk Media News and uh, talkmedianews.com, of course, the website. Danielle, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me, Tom. Thanks for joining us. You're at the Supreme Court every day that they have arguments, arguments yes. and and uh, you just came from there? I did, I did. So I'm, I'm, I wanted to talk about this uh, this. Uh, 4-4 split this uh, that happened yesterday, but also, you know, what's going on today? What What's at the top of your list? Well, going with the 4-4 split from yesterday, okay. basically the court affirmed a lower court ruling that kept in place saying that a, a rule saying that a woman had to co-sign for her husband's loan was not you know, discrimination in and of itself. So having the fact that only four, ju- four justices on both sides said this is going to be affirmed, but with no precedential opinion, we really don't know what the law is in this area. So, uh, I mean, this is the worst case scenario that uh, that the, uh, John Roberts warned about three weeks before Scalia died, basically, mm-hmm. which and when he said, please, you know, nominate, uh, advise and consent and appoint justices quickly. Uh, there's a lot going on here. And and we had two different circuit courts. Uh, the, the one level below the Supreme Court, uh, regional courts in the United States rule in two different ways on this case. And so if the Supreme Court deadlocks 4-4 on it, that just leaves those lower rulings in place, both pro and con, right? Exactly. And so this we have just different laws in the United States, depending on where you live. I'm sorry. Exactly. And what's going to happen is we're going to have all these murky laws, depending on where you live, and we're not going to have settled law. And that is why we have a Supreme Court to get settled law. Right. So we're all operating under the same fair and equal laws. Right. And why it's always an odd number of people that, that has been suggested for the court, as far as I recall. <clears throat> so this case, I remember, you know, being, being the old fart that I am, um, you know, I remember when back in the '70s, uh, when the, the, in fact the first business I was running, uh, the, you open the newspaper and it would be help wanted women, help wanted men, right? And the help wanted women were uh, teachers or secretaries or whatever, and the help wanted men were pretty much anything. And and I remember uh, Louise getting a credit card, and I had to co-sign as her husband, not because she didn't have great credit or anything like that, but because she was my wife. I mean, it was like the. the I, the, People, you know, young people who aren't as old as I am, just, you know, have no recollection of that. Um, This case sounds like the opposite. A wife had to sign for her husband. Was there a law? I mean, what's the, what was the, what, what provoked this? Or was it, he simply wasn't credit worthy enough and he needed another signature? That, that seems like a routine thing. It does seem like a routine thing. If you actually look at the facts of the case, whenever whenever a married person commits to do something, you really do need to have the other spouse on board saying that we're going to commit and not necessarily tie one individual in a, in a marriage where your finances are all mixed to something where the other person has no knowledge. So having the spouse come in and say, yes, I co-sign with this, it seems like a logical thing. Right. But the argument was by making me come in as his spouse, you're discriminating against me. How so? How so in the sense that he should be able to sign on his own. So by making me the co-signer, you're making me liable for his debt and discriminating against me as his spouse. Right. Now, I could see where, um, not not trying to take any position on this at all, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Donald Trump and people like him on his third trophy wife uh, with no doubt, uh, I mean, he's worth a billion. There's no doubt in my mind that if she leaves him, she's not going to be worth a half a billion. Exactly. It's, it's going to, you know, that there's that there's prenuptials and there's there is actually a legal and financial firewall between the two of them. And they probably file their tax returns separately. So somebody in a situation like that might say, no, I'm not going to sign for my spouse because, uh, you know, we're separate, uh, more separate entities. You know. And we, we work separately. He's his own person. He's his own individual. He does right. his own business things. And I don't want to be dragged into this. Right. And so she said that because I was his wife, you discriminated against me. Yeah. And forcing me to sign this. So, so the court. Uh, this is interesting. Was this a conservative, liberal split, or was it? Uh, I, well, actually, we don't know. We just know it was a four-four split, uh-huh. and that means when this vote was taken, Justice Scalia did not sit in on this, or this vote happened after he passed away. Right. So that means we pro- who knows how this shakedown is, and really, it doesn't even really matter because it doesn't set any type of precedent. Right. Right. Uh, so we're stuck now with people in one part of the, with these different standards. So what happened in the court today? Well, today we heard another case on contraception. 
Today being the sixth anniversary of the Affordable Care Act, the fourth time it's been to the Supreme Court. This is the uh, this is Hobby Lobby too, right? Kind of, yes. Um, with Hobby Lobby, you had the fact that there were there were some exemptions given to uh, nonprofit. Mm-hmm. Organizations and these this or, this for profit organization was not given the same accommodation. Right. With this is more along the lines of these religious organizations don't like the accommodation they've been given. Right. Another way. So so basically, this is the Affordable Care Act, and if you want to exempt yourself from having to provide contraceptives as part of the benefits that you give your employees because you religiously object to that. That was Hobby Lobby. They said, yes, well, you're a corporation, so we'll consider you a person under the Constitution, and, and you, you, can, you can have that religion and that exemption. So now a nonprofit corporation has come forward. This is, what, a Catholic group? These are Catholic entities, uh, schools, uh, you name it. They're, they're there. Right. And they're saying, we don't want to be paying for contraception for our employees, and we're actually the religious folks here. And uh, it, well, this is the breakdown of that, because it, that it, that sounds like that would still be a little murky. But the way this breakdown is the government has offered this accommodation for individual employers for nonprofits. Right. They have to fill out a form, they fill out a form and say, we object to this based on our deeply held religious beliefs. And that's it. Right. This means at this point, the third party insurer, whether it be Blue Cross, Aetna, they come in and provide it through these providers. Right. And so that way the employer is not paying for the insurance, that no money is coming out of their pockets. And that way there's supposed to be this this wall there. Right. But today in the arguments, we heard um, advocates say that by having to fill out this form to opt out, that in and of itself was a substantial burden on their religious beliefs. Right. And substantial burden is the phrase that was in the previous decision that said, you know, a substantial burden shall not be imposed. Exactly. This is under the RIFRA, the Religious Freedom uh, Liberty Act of 1993. Right. And basically it said that unless the government has a compelling go- uh, government interest in whatever uh, religious freedom and religious liberty, religious liberty as it's confined, right. um, will always win out. Right. What was your sense of... Uh how this is going to, I mean, it seems a little absurd to say filling out a piece of paper once a year. Um, in fact, the, the, the thought that came into my mind is um, if I want to exempt myself from the military and I'm of draft age, I don't just automatically get an exemption um, by saying, by, by, you know, just, just, uh, you gotta, you've got to actually apply for conscientious objector status based on religion. That's an accommodation. It's a, it, and you've got to jump through some hoops in order to accomplish that accommodation. How is this different from that? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that is exactly the um, hypothetical that the justices considered right off the bat. And they're like, you have to at least tell us that you want this exemption right. for us to know that you want the exemption. Right. And so there, there was a lot of back and forth about why this is different because even if you are a conscientious objector in the draft, you might still have to someone else might be able to take your place. And by someone taking your place and doing the work that you don't want to do, that, uh, some people argue, was still a substantial burden on their religious liberty. And that is just not the way, obviously, the liberal um, wing of the court saw things. Like Just because you're raising your hand saying, I don't want to be counted, is not a substantial burden. You have to inform us that you don't want to be counted in this. Yeah, it seems like this is just a mechanical process. This This is not a... A burden, you know, an intentional. It's not. This is not like the trap laws, you know, where they're they're literally trying to put abortion clinics out of business, you know, with little legal gimmicks. This is not trying to prevent the Catholics, for example. Exactly, and that is what um, the Solicitor General brought up. He's like, this is the best way we can do this, but we have to know who are those people that are objecting to this, and that there are other ways around this to be, be able to protect the, the young Most women. The justices seem need this. to agree with that. Logic. It's going to be a fourth, at least a four-three, with Justice Kennedy being our swing vote. Once here. more, once Amazing. more. Amazing, Danielle Blevins, uh, the Supreme Court reporter with Talk Media News. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much, Tom. To watch more clips from our programs, hit the Watch More Videos button over here, and please be sure to hit the handy dandy subscribe button. So you'll always be up to date. Tag, you're it. <laughs>